Welcome to the Hockey Podcast. I am Luke Lipinski. And I'm Doug Cannon. On this week's show, we break down the Pacific Division. The Coyotes have stability. The Canucks have everything riding on Roberto Luongo. And the Flames, well, the draft is only 10 months away. <laughs> we'll also look at hockey down under, as well as news and notes from around the world of hockey. All that and more. Let's drop the puck on episode 18. All right, Doug Cannon, Luke Lipinski here sitting alongside you to your right. Across from me. Across, You're not sitting whatever. beside me. This is... I don't know where you are. You're over there somewhere. I'm over on this side of the table. Looking at the Pacific Division today, the final of our four award-winning division previews. I don't know which awards they've won, but I'm going to go ahead and give myself some awards. I got an Oscar. Well, that shows how easy it is to get one of those these days. But anyway, the Pacific today, we did the Metro last week, the Atlantic the week before, and the Central to start things off a couple weeks back. Pacific Division... In a lot of ways, you can make the case is the toughest. If it's not, the Metro might be just because it has the extra team. But seven teams in this division, I think you could make a very valid and compelling case that six of them are legitimate playoff contenders. And we'll get into it here and then see if you agree with me or disagree with me. I think seven of the eight are legitimate playoff. I think there's only one team in the Pacific Division that's going to struggle. You just said what I just said. I did. Six out of seven teams can make the playoffs in this division. One of them... Isn't making the play- I don't know if one of them would make the playoffs in the Oh, AHL. I'm sorry. I had eight in my head. Same. Why did I have eight? It's, I uh, we're in the it's West again. Eight. It's seven. I'm sorry. It's a whole new era. Gary Bettman's got me all confused. That, that was the whole point of actually a realignment was just to kind of throw you off. And he did it. But I agree. I concur. Now we'll see if it's the same team. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Let's start with Anaheim. Yeah, it's not hard to guess which team we're talking no, about. No, it is not. The Anaheim Ducks, though, are a pretty solid team. And... They were a club last year, finished second in the Western Conference, and it seemed like they might have the the horses to go deep, maybe even knock off Chicago. They matched up very well with the Blackhawks, and then, as it turns out, they let a late series lead against the Red Wings slip away. They don't even make it out of the first round. Yeah, I was confused. I didn't think that was going to happen. I did not see that happening at all. But let's also look at the fact that they finished in their last 18 games last season. They went eight, six, and four, whereas they started twenty-two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah, they started off great. Remember last year, everybody talked about the Blackhawks. They were twenty-one, zero, and three. Anaheim was right there, with right them, there, and right they kept there. beating them. Yes. They kept beating Chicago. That to me is the perfect example of no matter how good your season was, and no matter how down it seems like Detroit is that year, you don't ever want to play Detroit in the playoffs. You just don't. Yeah, I mean, every time we live in Phoenix, so I mean. We we follow the the Coyotes really closely, so it's like as a Coyotes fan, you're like, oh please, not Detroit. Give but me I, St. Louis, give me Columbus, yeah, but, but give me Nashville, but don't give me Detroit. But I think for that very reason, that. for I, that very reason, I think everybody thinks that because they are the sort of team that they know what it takes to get through the regular season, mm-hmm. and you know they're going to be better than they were in the regular season in the playoffs, and that's what Anaheim ran into, and they still almost took them out, which is why Anaheim is a dangerous team, although they are now minus Bobby Ryan. And that was my question. Good. What kind of impact is that going to have losing him? Well, right off the top, I mean, you lose your number three point producer from last year. Mm -hmm. More than that, I think you lose a guy. That that top line of of Corey Perry, Ryan Getzlaff, and Bobby Ryan for the last couple of years, you could make a case. If it's not the best line in hockey, it's one of the best lines. One of the best. But Anaheim hasn't had a whole lot of scoring depth behind that so that it leads into my question which is kind of a branch of yours are they going to get that secondary scoring now are the young guys going to step up now that Bobby Ryan's gone they they had some guys that looked better last year Emerson Etzim Kyle Palmieri the former first rounder back in 2009 he had 21 points in 42 games Nick Bonino Matt Bolesky a lot of those guys showed up in that series against Detroit too but it's going to take a little bit from all of them to replace what you had in Bobby Ryan because that's a guy that could score you 30 goals yeah, but I mean their blue line's pretty good. Goaltending, they're good. So I would have to agree that scoring, where where are they going to get all that scoring up front? Guess loves in a contract year, yes. No, uh, they just resigned. They, they just, just both resigned. Got resigned yeah. Yes, for quite a bit of money, I might add. Just a little bit. So yeah, that that's actually a good thing to bring up. Corey Perry is making eight point six two five million dollars from here until the end of eternity, two thousand twenty one. And Ryan Getzlaff is also signed through 2021. He's making a little bit less, but not much, $8.25 million. We talked about this with Pittsburgh last week. 
can you win when you have that much money tied up in just a couple guys? If either one of them gets injured, Anaheim's probably done this year. How about the $2 million uh, price tag they got uh, Dustin Penner for? He's a proven playoff performer. I mean, that's a nice little quiet pickup that nobody really talked about, and it's, it's great for him. He has to move about – he probably doesn't have to move at all, actually. I mean, he has to move from L.A. to Orange County. Yeah, but, but you got a point guy in Surrey. Yeah, they're, they're solid on the blue line. I mean, they're, they're a very solid team all the way around. And they're solid in net. So Jonas Hiller – I just I I I keep I go back to the last 18 games of last season is like what happened? Why did the wheels fall off? Cuz it carried into the playoffs. Well, yeah, it's it's hard to tell if they overachieved for the first half of last year or if they underachieved for the second half, but they were basically two different teams. But on paper, this team's got all the talent in the world to, to do something. <laughs> That's good. You want to be able to do something, whether it's win hockey games or They'll be in the playoffs. Okay. That's they will. It? That's it? Yep. Uh, they will be in the playoffs. Even in this division. Even in this division. Jonas Hiller, I would imagine, is going to be the starter, but Victor Faust was really solid last solid. year. Solid. Kind of coming out of nowhere. Their numbers, Faust was 15-6-2, and two, a 2.18 goals against average. Hiller was 15-6-4, and 2.36. Very similar goalies, but I don't think really yeah. anybody knew Victor Faust's name before last year. Yeah, but Hiller's the – he's he's – it's his job to lose. How many times have we heard that? But it's true. You're not going to – no no play on Victor Foss' name? I just keep saying his name waiting for I you know, to I know, I know. Foss and the I always, Furious? I always get laughed at. Foss times at Ridgemont High? Foss. Okay. This sounds like you got a lisp. We both like Victor Anna. Foss. <laughs> it's good. It's good. The, the, the Ducks are, are certainly a team to look at. That's this whole division. There's six very just good teams that could do some damage. Anaheim's one of them. Do predictions at the end or you want to do them now? Let's do them at the end because I don't have them yet. Okay. We'll do it at the end. <laughs> Good right. enough. Corey Perry, though, one last thing on them. A decent year last year. Do they need more from him? He finished with 36 points, 15 goals, and 44 games. It's a guy that won the Hart Trophy a couple years ago. And his production hasn't been bad since then, but it has declined each year since he won the, the Hart Trophy in 2010 11. Mm -hmm. Do they need. Uh, they're going to have to get more from him now, right? Yeah. Well, they have to get. With Bobby gone, that's why my question was around Bobby Ryan. I mean, there's points out the window, so somebody's got to pick up the slack. Corey Perry's got the talent to do that. Dustin Penner's got the talent to help out there. And the other thing with Corey Perry, too, he's a guy that is good at going to the net without the puck and scoring some of those dirty goals that a guy like Bobby Ryan kind of sets up for you by getting that first shot. So it's going to be harder for him to score with Ryan gone. Hey, you know as well as I do, I coach youth hockey, and... One of the biggest things we tell players is the guy without the puck is like one of the most dangerous guys on the ice. Really and is. all you got to do is go to the net. Go to the net. Go to the net. And some of that is... Chicago proved that in the final. Yeah, and Chicago did it with or without the puck. Corey Perry does it both ways as well, but if you are good at doing that without the puck, some of that I think is just you can't even be taught. Some of it's just intuition. The truth be told, when I watch a hockey game, I'm watching stuff away from the puck. I very rarely follow the puck. I'm following the guy on the weak side to see how he's setting up because eventually the puck is going to go there. Spoken like a true coach right there. But Corey Perry, one of those guys that's very good. I mean, that's what made Gretzky so great is what he could do without the puck. Right. And Corey Perry's not there. on that level. But Our theory is proven. Yeah, if, if if Gretzky proves your theory, you go ahead and just believe that it's probably true. I mean, that guy wasn't he wasn't the biggest or the fastest, but he knew where the puck was going and he got there before it. Right. So that's that's something to watch with Anaheim. I mean, they're gonna need another huge season from Corey Perry. Next <laughs> There's no real I way laugh. to transition. That's rude. That's, that is, rude. that's very that's rude. rude. I hope they win the Stanley Cup now and just <laughs> throw it right in your it's face. It's not gonna happen. No, it's not. The Calgary Flames who's gonna ask the question here first? I, I wonder if maybe we have the same question. Uh, my question is, um, will their fans stay with them? Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's, I think we can we can answer that one first. I mean, you know, Calgary is a great hockey city. They've been waiting for a while for a winner. <laughs> this is a very patient city, man. And that is not going to happen this year. You know, and they lose last year. They lose their big boy in Jerome. You know, he was the face of that franchise oh, forever. And if he wasn't, then Kiprasov was the face and. No. Ah. Yeah, it's it's just 
it's going to be a rough year for Calgary. I think if you are a, a hardcore hockey fan of the Flames, you in some way are kind of happy that this is at least finally happening. They've spent the last few years just hovering, trying to trying to do everything they could to sneak in as, as maybe the eighth seed in the Western Conference. You never get a great pick. You never really fully commit to just an all-out rebuild. You know, when you're a fan going into a season, you want to say, this is what our team's trying to do this year. Ideally, you want to say your team's trying to win the Stanley Cup, but at least if you're a Calgary fan, you can say, we're, we're evaluating a lot of young talent and we're building for the future. At least you're doing that. The last couple of years, it was just let's hover around and, and see if we have to trade a Ginla. Yeah, you know, and when I see stuff like this, <clears throat> whoops, when I see stuff like this, it makes me think about how fast fans, fast, fast, okay. how fast they are, um, jump on a player that's not performing. Let's say. All right. Okay. Example. Uh. Brzgalov. <laughs> Good example. Good example, right? <laughs> okay. So they're all over him, get rid of him, he's a waste, blah, 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 all the all the descriptions. And then you have a, a franchise that is just stuck in mud and spinning their wheels, and they're not doing anything to get out of that mud. They're just spinning and spinning and spinning. When a coach is losing, coach is gone. But when a franchise is spinning, it's like, why aren't we looking at the front office? Why wasn't this momentum done sooner? Yeah, I, I, and I you think said it. That's you a said fair point. why wasn't it done sooner? And it's like, well, then why isn't all the attention going to the front office because they're the decision makers, and they're the ones that are saying, okay, we're going to get this guy, we're going to get that guy. I mean, it's been no secret. Ginla wanted to go a long time ago. Yeah, I, th- I, mean, I think it was tough for him. I don't think he necessarily wanted to leave Calgary, but I think that he looked around and said, look, I've been in this league for a long time. I want a- at least a chance to win, and this team is not... They were slowly trending downhill, and mm-hmm. they were already downhill. Now they're just right off the edge of the cliff, but sometimes you have to do that. Yeah, I guess, but... It, ju- it should have happened it comes earlier, to players right? and coaches, it's it's always a quick decision. And it just seems with the front office, it just takes a little bit longer. Um that kind of feeds into to my question of who do they take with the first overall pick in next year's draft because they're going to get it, correct? I agree. I mean, I understand there's a lottery, so that it's it's not guaranteed that just because you have the We're not being record, mean here. We just, you know, there's just the situation they're in. No, no, th- and I think that's their plan. I mean, I think they've kind of accepted that. If you're a guy like Mike Camilleri, that's kind of tough because you're a veteran player that goes out there and, you know, he's he's at the latter stages of his career and he's, proven that he can play in this league, mm-hmm. he's going to be surrounded by a lot of guys that are trying to prove they can play in this league. Right. So uh, maybe Calgary surprises us, but I, I, surprising me would be they are not one of the bottom two or three teams in the NHL. Okay, so I can put us both down for Calgary at seven. Yeah. Okay. It's a good teaser. We don't have, you know, so we only have to announce the six. That's true. <laughs> that, that is very true. <laughs> one thing, though, I, I there was an article about this a few weeks back that said uh, – the situation that the Flames are in, there's a lot of young players that are coming there with the thought of this is this is my year to prove I, I belong in this league. So that's going to foster a sort of environment of competition that if it's handled correctly, could be really helpful two or three years down the line. So in a situation like that, you get some overachieving. So they probably win a few more games than they normally would because you do have young, hungry guys, and that's to be understood. But I still don't think they're going – to make the playoffs. No, and, and you hear coaches talk to and they, and they say, you know, this team is it's just a bunch of guys out there with something to prove and they're they're playing for jobs. That doesn't make them an easy team to play on any given night. Right. So it's like not like when you see Calgary on the schedule you're just guaranteed to win. Mm-hmm. If you think that way you're going to lose, but over the course of 82 games, I I can't see them winning very many. Yeah, I the coach of this team is just going to have to <laughs> he's got to shoot for wins, but it's going to be more of a development process. Speaking of development, Edmonton Oilers, they are pretty much right now, I think, where the Flames want to be in three or four or five years. I think Edmonton's the team to watch in this division. Edmonton's a dangerous team. I saw them, uh, I saw uh, predictions the other day they had the Oilers finishing number two in the Western Conference. I think that's a bit a- it's ambitious. lofty. But they've been building for a while now. They've essentially been doing what maybe Calgary should have been doing, which probably makes it that much tougher for Flames fans because you're, you're in Alberta looking at your rival building towards the future. Mm-hmm. Edmonton is a team that whenever they pull it all together, and it, it could be this year or it might not be for another two years, but when they do it, they're going to be tough. 
we all know that they've got a ton of young talent on this team. You've got Taylor Hall, Neil Yakupov, the player that everybody forgot, Sam <laughs> Gagne, um, Jordan Eberle, uh, who else? Uh, Justin Schultz. Nugent Hopkins, I mean. Nugent Hopkins, yeah. I mean, there is so much talent, and I think the thing I like the most about this team is that management kind of picked up a couple of veterans along the way. You got Andrew Ference now on D yep. to help out. And you got a guy, just a great, great character, hardworking guy in Boyd Gordon. Exactly what this team needed. Absolutely. You, he's going to, without saying a single word, he's going to have leadership in that locker room. And the guys are going to see that boy's work ethic in practice and the way he plays. Boyd Gordon is like one of my favorite players to watch to play. Yeah, because he he is exactly what a coach that has success in this league wants. He's the sort of player that will win you face-offs. Mm -hmm. He does all the stuff that isn't glamorous, and yet at the end of the day, you're like, oh, we're winning a lot more games. I wonder why. And it's because you have a guy. It, Boyd Gordon isn't the only one in the league, but he's one of the best at doing those little things. Well, I mean, you, if you break it down into simple terms, I mean, winning a face-off, does that sound like such a big feat or a big deal? No, but if you win the face-off, then your team has possession. That's a big deal. Especially in today's NHL where so many of the face-offs are either in the attack zone or in your defensive zone. Right. So you're talking about scoring chances. So it quickly becomes a big deal, and he's a guy that will block shots. More than anything, I just think his value is going to be amplified in Edmonton and, and this is where the Oilers now give them credit they've been patient mm -hmm. they've waited for this sort of era where they've got all these skill guys and they've been fortunate to, to continuously get the number one overall pick to some of these years but they got all those young skill guys you just mentioned they were able to go out this offseason and say we need a vet that's going to be gritty like Boyd Gordon we're going to trade and get a guy like David Perron who when he's healthy is is huge they could just fill holes that are easier to fill than or to fill than we need a guy like Taylor Hall. Right. You're not going to be able to just go out and do that. Right, right. And then, so what do you think their uh, Achilles heel is? Well, it is, I mean, this leads into my main question for them, and I think it's it's everybody's main question. Is Devin Dubnik the answer in goal, or are they going to have to make a trade midseason? He wasn't horrible last year, but he wasn't. It, I guess it comes back to what Edmonton's goal is for this season. If they're just trying to get in the playoffs, a 2.57 goals against average can get you in. But again, even at the goalie position, they brought in a veteran backup goalie in Jason LaBarbera. A very solid backup who can so, come in and, and spell him. But he's, but he's a veteran gonna... goalie too. Yeah, and he, he understands the game, so he's somebody that can teach Dubnik. He can teach. He can, you know, you know, simple things about, you know, just chilling out, settling down, all the little – X factor things that you don't really see. I mean, you see a guy watching, you know, a game on television. You see a guy behind the net and go, "Oh, he missed that one. That was soft." That was. There's little nuances, and I think Jason can bring that. But I, if I look at this roster top to bottom, I think that's the only place where it might hurt them. Well, it, they've kind of built the team backwards from the way a lot of organizations like to build. I mean, we've talked about this in the past. You want to start with the goalie. You want to get the defense, then go up the middle and, and spread out to the wings. You know, they've got the forwards, but last year is when they really started to put a defensive group together. And goaltending, I mean, Devin Dubnik is 27 years old. His goals against average in his four years in the league, 2.57 last year, 2.67 the year before, 2.71, 3.57. Nothing stellar there. And this is a team that could score, but you always need your goalie to be able to just win you some games. So 2.5, I round that up to 3. So this Whoa, team okay. <laughs> you're, you're, I see what you're saying. You're going to need probably four goals to win. Most four to five goals a game to win. That's a lot of scoring. Which they can do, but it's tough to depend on that consistently. 82 games, yeah, exactly. I, um, They make the playoffs, though. Really? Yes. Well, and once they make the playoffs, I think they're going to be there for a while. Not not that they're going to make a deep run this year, but they're going to be there for the next five, six, seven, eight years. I didn't say they go deep. I just said they would make it. But you would agree. The year they finally break through and make it, and these young guys – experience what it takes to make the playoffs. They're not leaving the playoffs for a few years. They they were close last year. Yeah, but they, they do exactly what we just kind of alluded to. They go on a nice run. They're one of the tougher teams to play on any given night, but they can't be consistent. And Maybe that's goaltending. Maybe that's goaltending, but I think you might see a little bit more consistency with some of the veterans they brought in to to help settle down those young guys. I mean, those young guys are just... 
go, 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 go. Like Taylor Hall skates 1,000 miles per hour you right know. into the wall. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he's a tough one, that one. And then we go to Tinseltown. Yeah, the LA Kings are – they are the opposite of the Oilers in that they have plenty of consistency. I tell you what, I was telling this off the air. This is the last division that that we have to do. I mean, we've gone through, we've previewed every team, and we've had at least one or two questions for each team. Mm-hmm. For the most part, without even thinking or looking at anything, I could come up with five, six, seven questions for every team. The LA Kings, it was tough to come up with one because they know what they're doing. They know it's successful. They have a great GM. Everything, Good coaching, excellent mm-hmm. goaltending. Yep. A bunch of guys that have won a Stanley Cup together so they know what it takes, and they're still together. I mean, they've kept this team together now for a couple of years. And you look at the, the, the sort of the players that are locked up long term, they're going to be together for a while. Mike Richards is locked up through 2020. Jeff Carter through 2022. Kopitar's there through 2016. Dustin Brown. Drew Doughty. Slava oh, yeah. Voinov. The X Factor this year, though, is Danny Carcillo. <laughs> He's probably the X factor in the locker room. I'll give you that. He's he's going to be interesting. Oh, I like Carcillo. He's a good guy. Yeah, he is. I don't know that he's going to swing everything in LA's favor one way or the other. My deal is, can they get back to the final? Well, okay. So I'll build off that. What is a successful season for this team? Do they have to win the Stanley Cup for this to be not a waste. I mean, this is a, they, they win the Cup two years ago. They go deep last year. Listen, every there's 30 teams in the NHL. Okay. <laughs> Just in case you forgot. All right. Wait, let me write right, this down. Write that Paper down. Okay. Every single team in the NHL, they have one goal and one goal only, is to win the Stanley Cup. I understand. Cup. That's a success. Give 110%. For, for, no, no, there's, Leave no, it such thing, the there's no such thing okay. as 110%. But okay. all I'm saying is that every team in the league wants to win the Stanley Cup. So – the question is, is that a successful season? Of course, that's a successful season. I think that if any team makes the playoffs, you've had a successful season. Okay. But you would agree different teams have different goals. The main goal is to win the Stanley Cup. If the Calgary Flames are over 500 this year, they should be pretty happy. If the Oilers make the playoffs and win a playoff series, that is a huge step from where they've been the last six, seven years. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they have multiple year plans, but... I think L.A. can go very deep this year. Well, L.A. is at the point. I guess that's that's the whole kind of angle I'm taking here. They are at the point where they should be in the Final Four every year. That's that's their plan going in. Make If the L.A. Kings make the playoffs this year and get knocked out in the first round. That's a problem. Yeah, they're not going to be happy. That's a step back, and it's a considerable step back because they were in the Western Conference Final last year, and they won it the year before. But if you said that four years ago about the L.A. Kings, people would look at you like you were insane. I think what you said earlier is the key is that they've got the core guy signed long term. Because, I mean, last week we talked about the Rangers. That could be a mess next year for the Rangers with all the free agents they have. Oh, yeah. This team is sewing up. And so, yeah, you're right in saying that they should be in the Final Four for at least two or three more years. Or they should, you know, they should at least be contending every year. They should always be a very tough out. Somebody you expect to go deep. Somebody you let's put it this way. If you were a team in the Western Conference and you have your sights set on winning the West, you know you're gonna have to go through LA. Yeah, but you know what? LA does have one little weak spot, and I don't know a lot about him, but Jonathan Quick's new backup is Ben Scrivens. Well, he played in Toronto, so that should tell you all you need to know. <laughs> but that's a question mark. Particularly for this team. I mean, Scrivens for what he is wasn't bad in Toronto. But if he becomes the starter on a team that relies on their goalie to not give up any goals, we that know Quick everything. can play. We know Quick can do it. But if he gets hurt, or if he gets tired, and they have to, you know, he can't play eighty-two games. Yeah, Jonathan Bernier is gone now, and that was always kind of a nice safety net that they never had to use. But they knew that he was a very he was good there. goalie. Yeah. So, if I have one question mark about this team, it's goaltending. Not in the fact that Jonathan Quick he's solid. It's just that what happens if he's sick or hurt? Can Scriven step in and, and you know at least keep him in games or win a few games? I think with this defense he can, but if, if yeah. Jonathan Quick is gone for a month, then they're going to have problems. And we, that, hey, you know that's on the coaching staff. They've got to make sure that this defensive core knows that. Hey, look, if Quick's not in the pipes, then we're relying on you to block shots and keep that puck away from the goalie. Which they can do. I mean, they step it up in the playoffs every sure. year, doing exactly that. Can we, we agree we're calling him Johnny Quick now? It sounds like a '50s like drag racer. 
Johnny Quick. I never called him Johnny Quick. No, but I'm saying we should. Of all the guys that go by Johnny instead of Jonathan, if your name is Jonathan Quick, you should be Johnny Quick. People that go by their formal first name are very passionate about being called the proper name. So I'm definitely calling him Johnny Quick. That'll piss him off. Okay. okay. <laughs> all right. Maybe we get him on the show. I worked with a guy by the name of Francis, and I called him Frank one day. I thought he was going to take my head off. You worked with a guy named Francis? Francis. That's a name? That's a name. All right. And I'm like, dude, why don't you want to be called Frank? That's a dude's name. <laughs> You're doing him a favor. Uh, well, that's what I thought. Yeah. My name is Francis. My mother gave me that name. All right, mama's boy. Well, we agree to the, the king for the kings every year is Johnny Quick. Johnny Quick. You're listening to The Hockey Podcast. Feel free to email comments or questions to the show at our email address, thehockeypodcast at gmail.com. Second half of the Pacific Division preview here rolling right along. This will be it, Doug. We've done 27 teams. Season's not that far off. What it's is right it? around the corner, man. August 25th, rookie camp's coming up. Season's already started for me, man. I got three boys playing travel hockey. Yeah, so yeah. Season never ends for you, then. It's just go, go, go. Well, we've got three teams left to talk about. I don't, what are we even going to do next week's show? Next week's show is going to be it's going to be craziness. Just it's pandemonium. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> okay, it's good. It'll be something to look forward to. We are well, going to do. you know, training camps are opening. Oh, no, there will be quite a bit to talk about. Yeah, but so. it won't be structured for the first time in about a month. I mean, this has been weird. We've actually had structure. We've had direction. Is that what you call that? Well, <laughs> okay. More more than I'm comfortable with. All right. Three teams left. Phoenix Coyotes, a team you and I are very familiar with as we are looking outside and it's sunny and warm. Well, sunny is. There's a lot of clouds still. A lot of clouds which is nice. by Phoenix standards. <laughs> yeah. And that there is one out there. So the Coyotes, you probably could make a very strong case they had the biggest offseason of any team in the NHL, correct? Yes. I, I don't even know that there's really an argument there. I don't disagree. So let's, so let's go down the list. Well, let's go. Let's start with last year. Shane Doan could have left. Didn't. <sighs> yes, he signed. In my mind, not surprising because of who Shane Doan is, but a tremendous sign of loyalty. Right. And that was contagious. Mm-hmm. I agree. Contagious throughout the locker room. And then this year, Don Maloney's back. Brad Tree Living's back. Dave Tippett is back. Mike Smith is back. In a, a thing that I, you know, I'm one of those whack jobs, but. I know. The thing that gets overlooked a lot, too, is the whole minor league system is intact. Coaches, trainers. So that whole feed system, the whole thing that that team is built on, it's all intact. The whole hockey. Hockey? Hockey. I play hockey. (laughs) Occupy hockey. I play hockey. I shoot the puck. I play. Different accent every week on this show. (laughs) But um, there's stability and consistency. Thank you. That's what I was going to I think that's what you were trying to say, but I'm going to say it in English. Luke the thesaurus. <laughs> Stability and consistency. <laughs> it's huge. I mean, Dave Tippett said this last year. Look at this team's history. Four years ago, Dave Tippett takes over, and they, they were struggling to make mm-hmm. the playoffs every year. In the four years since he's been here, playoffs three straight years, Western Conference Finals one of those years. Last year, they missed the playoffs, and I've said this over the last three weeks now as we've previewed teams. I think there were certain teams that were hurt by the lockout more than others, and I've been consistent in that. I think Nashville, Philadelphia, and Phoenix were three of the teams that were hurt more than most. But Dave Tippett said near the end of last season, and again, this is a guy who is not used to missing the playoffs. Seven years in Dallas made it six years, and some of those weren't great teams. Mm -hmm. This Coyotes team he has moving in the right direction, they play very well as a team, better than most teams as a team. And he said the key for 2013-14 is basically making the, that shortened 2012-13 season a thing of the past, something you skip right over, and you want to build off the momentum of now two seasons ago heading into this year. And to do that, you bring all the guys back, and that's what they've done. And like you said, all the way down to the minor league level, everything is intact. You do all that work to change the culture of a franchise. You don't want to just give it up. No, and... Then on top of that, the ownership yeah, question we haven't gotten to that yet. has been – well, it goes into the whole stability thing. The ownership question is not a question anymore. It's been answered. It's done. The team has new ownership. Hence, now you've got stability from the very top down to the minors. Ownership that appreciates the sort of work that Tippett and Maloney and, and this team have done. Absolutely. This could be a great season for this team. I think this is going to be a great season for this team. So my, and, 
Well, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, my question is special teams. I mean, if you're going to go down to, to where they struggled last year and w- what hurt them, it was special teams. And it's a question they may have addressed by bringing in Mike Ribeiro. Right. Um, but let's be specific. Special teams on the offensive side or spe- special teams on the defensive side? I think you're referring to the power play. I'm referring to the power play. Last year was ranked 25th, 14.8%. The penalty kill... And we're not saying anything out of school because Tippett's addressed it a thousand times. Oh, yeah, no, he's brought it. Now, the, the penalty kill last year was 22nd, which I think will just naturally go back up. Normally, the penalty kill, again, that, that I think is a stat that was kind of impacted just by the shortened season, all the craziness that went along with that injuries and, and whatnot. That's the, the power play is very clearly the one area that this team needs to fix, but they don't need to be a top 10 team. They do everything else so well that the power play is just middle of the pack scoring the big goals that they did two years ago, they're going to be fine. And that's why you bring in Mike Ribeiro, led the NHL in power play assists last year. It's exactly, if he does that again, it's exactly what this team needed. Well, my uh, my son's a midget, and he has a coach, and his coach has a saying, will over skill. That's what this club reminds me of. Yeah, that the, describes the, this team pretty well. This team just works hard, does what is asked of the coach, plays into the coach's system, and just executes, and that's how they get their success. They're all on the same page. Coach Tippett has them all on the same page. Will over skill. You don't have Sidney Crosby on this roster. You don't have Malkin on this roster. You don't have Joe Thornton on this roster. You don't have uh, Ovechkin on this roster. But you've got a roster full of hockey players that know how to play the game. When you make the NHL, you're good. Yeah, every, everybody that's in the NHL is good. You're a good hockey player. If you make the big show, you're a good hockey player. And Coach Tippett has a roster of players that are all set to go. You've shored up your goaltending by re-signing Mike Smith. You brought in Mike Ribeiro to help with the offense. The defense, we're not even talking about the defense because it is such a strong point. Right. I mean, maybe we should for a second. You look around the league, there are so many teams that overpay for defensemen every every year in the summer because they need – the need for quality defense is extremely high for 85% of the teams in the league. Now, the Coyotes are one of the reasons why it's so high for everybody else, because they have all of them. <laughs> I mean, they, we haven't even mentioned the fact they re-signed Oliver ekman Larson in the middle of the season last year. Probably a Norris Trophy contender at some point in the next couple of years. You've got Keith Yandel, who's been a, a perennial all-star for this team. Then you've got role players that know what they're doing on defense, like Mc, Zabinik McCulloch. Rusty Klesla, Derek Morris. I mean, talk about fundamentally sound players. And they've still got guys coming up. You've got um, a guy that has come a long, long way in David Schlemko. His yeah. game is just leaps and bounds. Then you got young Chris Summers. You got Michael Stone, David Runblad. I mean, they got a lot of good young guys. Brandon Gormley, Connor Murphy, a couple first round picks over the last few years that have looked good. Yeah, I, I mean, defensively. These guys are ready to go. I would I would put this defense up with pretty much any defense in the NHL. And that and that's why the power play doesn't have to be great. It's just got to be solid. I agree. And it helps to have Mike Smith back. That is a it's a very nice signing this this it's offseason. A great signing this offseason. Kind of gets lost in the shuffle of ownership and everything, but if you if you made a checklist a year ago of everything that you want the Coyotes to do. How about this? Coming out of the Western Conference Finals last year, you lose to LA. If you're a Coyotes fan, you make a checklist of 20 things that you wanted them to be able to do. They've done all of them now, most of them this summer. They've resigned all the key players. The ownership is stable. Tippett's back. Maloney's back. Tree Living's back. Everything is now set for this season. So it's going to be interesting to see now how they perform when they don't have a bunch of outside distractions that they've become used to. It's a very good point, and I think they'll answer to the bell because yeah. this is what everybody's wanted. Everybody's wanted this. The fans have wanted it. The players have wanted it. This is what they've wanted, and now I think we should see Another nice roll from this club. Finally get to see them turned loose without any sort of... The only thing that we obstacles. haven't addressed with this club is the signing of Mikel Botker. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of those situations. There's there's a few of these around the league. We're going to get into the Toronto one later on. Um, he's a guy that I, I would imagine will be back, and he's one of those young players that... There's a lot of good vets on this team. There's a lot of quality vets, like you said, know how to play the game of hockey. The sum of the, the parts on this team is, is, is greater than each individual. But Mikel Botker is a good young player with so much speed that he gets in there and mixes up very nicely with guys like Shane Doan, potentially Mike Ribeiro. 
you know, he gets back. That's that's just a little bit more offense that could be a real nice boost for this team. I agree. San Jose. <sighs> Always in the playoffs, never in the Stanley Cup. Okay, so my whole question with this club is can they finish in the playoffs? So let's just look at them. 91-92. Is it like the year 1991-92? Okay. The first year. Are we going 22 years of San Jose Sharks history yep. here? Okay. <laughs> All right. So since 1991-92 to 2012-2013. Oh, that was quick. The Sharks have only missed the playoffs five times. And I remember that when they first started out, they weren't a very good team. So I'm guessing most of those five were in the first seven years. For uh, the first five, actually. Actually, the first five... They were out four. Okay. For six. They missed four out of the first six. And then the remainder, they only missed once. Um, but they never finish. They get stuck. The, the deepest they've gone is the third round. Which, you know, that's not bad. It goes back to what we were saying earlier. What is a successful season? Well, I think, you know, Ron Wilson, during his tenure as coach, you know, that was his, the knock against him was that, you know, oh, you look, you got us to the second round. You got us to the third round. It's like, so the next progressive step is the finals, right? You would think. And just never did it. You know, and then Todd McClain comes in. In his first two seasons, they make the third round. As, yeah. You know, and then they don't go any deeper. And then last year they made the second round. The other th- interesting note with this club is since 2001, 2002 – They've either finished first or second in the division. Well, I think what you're saying speaks kind of to my main point I wanted to make on this team. They are essentially, uh, they're always in the playoffs. I mean, they're a perennial lock to be in the playoffs. But I wonder if their window of opportunity to actually win the whole thing, I don't think it has closed yet, but I think it's very close close to closing. Very close. At least with this group. Because... Again, that resume you just read off is great. If you're the Columbus Blue Jackets, you would love to have that. You you would love to have your fans be able to count on you being in the playoffs every year. And 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 when you're in the playoffs, anything could happen. We know now that it hasn't happened. San Jose hasn't won the Stanley Cup, but they've been there every year with the chance. Every single April, their fans are gathering around with the thought that they have a chance to win the Stanley Cup. Right. So I mean, it's a double-edged sword. You're disappointed every year when you don't. But it, it goes back to expectations. For a team like Columbus, that would be great. For a team like San Jose that has been there so many times, for guys like Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe in particular, that are going to be unrestricted free agents next summer, and they're only playing to win the Stanley Cup now. Yeah, but San Jose is always making moves. They, they don't ever just sit pat. You know, they, they kept Rafi Torres. I think he's a great character player, you know. Okay. I've I just like the way he plays. Guy by the name of Logan Couture. Pretty good player. Pretty good player. Pretty, right? pretty good guy by the name of Logan Couture. So I mean, paper wise, this team is pretty strong. I just I wonder. It's not as extreme as it is with the Rangers over in the East, but this is kind of the Western Conference equivalent in that Thornton and Marlowe are the the two keys from the last however many years. The, that whole era, they're both unrestricted free agents. Next summer, let's just say this season just goes south and they miss the playoffs somehow. Are those guys coming back? Because they made the commitment this off season. Joe Pavelski and Logan Couture are both signed through the 2018-19 season for $6 million a season. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's who you're building around. You're building around Pavelski and you're building around Logan Couture. Antony Emi, solid in goal. Brent Burns is a forward now, apparently. <laughs> and a pretty decent one. But you have you have openly basically declared that the cornerstones of the future of your team are Joe Pavelski and Logan Couture. Which is fine. I mean, those are good players. But that's what I'm saying. This front office is almost like play, they play a chess game. They see what's ahead, and they start making moves. How old's uh, Thornton now? Yeah, he's, say, 34, 35 maybe. So he's still got years left in him, but you got to remember he's making seven million dollars this year. If you're Joe Thornton, you're not taking a major pay cut next season. He's still performing. It's not. Nece- I mean, statistically, it's not his fault that they haven't won the Stanley Cup. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. But I mean, who's going to pay seven mil- more than seven million to pick him up? 
But that's that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't know if San Jose is going to be able to. What can they offer him? You know, they can offer him maybe seven million again, but they're not going to offer him a ton of years. He finished last year with 40 points in 48 games. I mean, he's perennially one of the top assist men in the NHL. He had 33 assists last season. He's 34 right now. He's been in the league 15 years. I would expect another good season from him. What, 77 points the year before, 70, 89, 86, 96, 114. I mean, this is a guy that is one well, of the top I mean, point guys every he's year. Clearly, in, you know, he's in a contract year, so he's going to perform. So that either San Jose pays him or somebody else pays him. And somebody will pay him. I just don't know if it'll be San Jose unless they have a good year. I don't know. I think that Joe Thornton's almost the face of that franchise right now. And Yeah. But then if you do that, you can't probably pay Marlowe. So, I mean, it's just it's going to be an interesting storyline to watch. There's a lot of big unrestricted free agents next year as we go through all these teams, and you start to see the names that are outside of just the Rangers where everybody could leave next season. The guys like Phil Kessel and Dion Phaneuf, and here you've got Thornton. And I mean, there's going to be some big free agents next year because not all these guys are getting signed in the middle of the season. Yeah, and they all got big paychecks too. Speaking of big paychecks, Roberto Luongo, now the number one goalie in Vancouver. I don't see how it can be anybody else. Is he mentally there at this point? I don't know. TSN's about to do a sit-down with him. Oh, good. Okay. And Tortorella said he he and uh, Luongo have had multiple conversations and that everything is good and that Roberto just wants to play his game and be focused. And it sounds like the conversations were constructive and positive and moving forward. Because I think that John Tortorella is a smart enough coach that he's got to have Luongo settled in. Well, yeah, because Eddie lacks the backup. And we've mentioned this before. Eddie Lack might be a decent goalie someday. But for what Vancouver did, and they gave up Corey Schneider because they couldn't handle having two good goalies, essentially. And and they were paying them a lot just because of the way things worked out. They'd already invested so much in Roberto Luongo in that contract that is basically untradeable. That's the first untradeable contract in NHL history, right? Um. Well, of a player that is good that other teams <laughs> want. Let's put it that way. Well, there's this guy that went to the KHL. Okay. But again. Other teams wanted Roberto Luongo. True. And and still couldn't make the trade. They could have made the trade. I think just that everybody was hesitant to pick up the tab. Yeah. I don't think it was so much, oh, I don't want that guy. It's just that my cap space and my payroll says, if, I got to yeah, give up five, chop five players off to afford this guy. Obliterate your whole roster just to bring in a goalie. Right. And for the teams that were in the market for him, if they obliterated the rest of their roster, they weren't going to be any good. I mean, I think that uh, Toronto probably was the closest team that was almost willing to do that. But then you would have had riots in the streets of Toronto. Well, you would have lost Kadri. You would have lost. You would probably wouldn't have been able to sign Kessel. Right. They already can't sign some of their guys. So if you, you imagine Luongo's contract on top, they would be eighty billion dollars over the cap. So I think we know who the number one is. I think that John Tortorella is going to be the difference maker for this team this year. So that's my question. Is he the right guy for this job? I think John Tortorella is an excellent coach that it clearly wasn't working in New York anymore. But I think in Vancouver. I think it's going to work. And I think John Tortorella is the coach that you need in Vancouver. I shouldn't say the coach, but a coach of his style and his character. Because this team was just so, despite the goal tending issue, this team to me was just passive and just vanilla and just wah, wah, wah. I mean... It's very in-depth. <laughs> <laughs> on. There's a lot of talent on this team, and they do nothing. One playoff win, not series win, game in the last two years. For a team that is perennially at the top of their division, and that might be different this year because they weren't contending with the Anaheims and LAs and Phoenix of the world before, but they were perennially on top of their division in the race for the President's Trophy every year, and then they would get to the playoffs and either be swept out or taken out you know, with one win. Right. Now, again, they almost won the Stanley Cup a couple of years ago. Got so close, and in a lot of people's minds, melted down. But for me, the, the fans in Vancouver, I like that you're passionate, but they're so over the top sometimes that I think it, it hurts this team. And I think in the Luongo-Schneider situation, it definitely did for a while there. It wasn't the only thing, but I don't think it helped. Right. And then, you know, you've got 
the media doesn't help either because the media feeds off the energy from the fans and you know the fans are like we want this guy's head we want that guy's head and the the media is like that's a great storyline let's take that and run yeah you and, know, I, and the I goalie the true. goalie issue was just too easy not to run with and then you know the Canadian media media when it comes to hockey is like you go into the locker room you can't see the players because there's more media than there are players yeah and they're all asking the same question. You don't have 30 media members asking 30 different questions. You got 30 media qu- uh, members in front of one guy asking the one guy the same question 30 different, 30 different ways. ways. Yeah. Are you really <laughs> happy being the backup when right. you signed this 15 year deal or whatever it ended up being? That's got to play head games. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. But I, I just think this is such an amazing scenario that has played out because we just talked last week about how the one thing New Jersey has going for them is that they have Martin Brodeur and Corey Schneider. So they have it's two a good different goalies. scenario, though. Yeah, Vancouver had two very good goalies and couldn't handle it. But of those two goalies, you didn't have the caliber of a Martin Brodeur who's a solid, solid, solid veteran. I don't think Martin's ego is as big as Roberto's, and I don't think he... Oh, I think it's bigger. But it should be. He's a better player. But I think he, he seems to me, and this just is to me, he's in control of himself. He's in control of his environment. He's in control of his gray matter. He's just he's, in control. He's not in Vancouver. I hear what you're saying, but you know what? I think the reasoning for that might be is he's accomplished everything. He's won a Stanley Cup. He's won multiple Stanley Cups. Right. Everybody that looks at Martin Brodeur, even if you're a Rangers fan and you don't like him and say mean things about him, you look at Martin Brodeur and you say that is one of certainly one of the five best goalies in NHL history, if not number one. And the other thing to think of too, though, is that I think Luongo's wheels started to come off when he was named captain. Yeah, that was weird. That was a really weird thing. And then like, you're our leader. You're our guy. Oh, excuse me. Can I have that C back? Yeah, that's tough to do as a as a goalie, and it's always tough to lose the C. Receiving the C in hockey is such a huge honor. I remember the first time my son was given the C. I've never seen anybody smile like that in my entire it's, life. It, there's not anything in another sport because that rivals it. Because it was his peers that selected him, and his coach selected him. I remember his the day his coaches came to me and said, we're going to give your son the C. I said, get out of here. My kid. kid. (laughs) There's support from your parents. Uh, You sure you don't want to think this thing through? (laughs) And it was great. It was great for him. And just take that to the professional level. I mean, the NHL, it's the pinnacle of hockey. And somebody gives you that letter. I mean, that's huge. But now flip it. If it gets taken from you, which I A, imagine happens. Well, that's why I'm building it up. Because you take it away, and it's like, oh. Yeah, that's got to be so deflated. I imagine it would be like those 80 cop movies. When they just rip the badge right off the guy and he's right. like, you won't be needing this anymore. You're a disgrace. And that's where I'm saying I think that's where that downhill slide with his mental uh, strength happened. Yeah, and it's just tough to be a, a vocal leader as a goalie. I mean, you're, you're already – that's such a different position. Right. right? You're, you're, you're already kind of telling guys where to go, but to be a leader in the locker it room afterwards. really are all goalies there. All goalies? Absolutely not. Roberto Luongo, actually, through all this, seems like a goalie that has it together upstairs more than most. Come on, goalies are supposed to be educated people that stand in front of a hard piece of rubber that's coming 100 miles an hour. (laughs) Well, when you put it that way. I'm not saying they're not smart, they're just different. (laughs) But Luongo seems pretty normal. We'll see if if there can be anything normal in Vancouver. Okay, now comes... Any more in Vancouver? No, I'm done with I'm Vancouver. I'm done with Vancouver. All right. Were you going to transition to the eighth team? Well, I erased it. <laughs> Good. All right. Wait, wait a minute. That team's not in this division. Yeah, exactly. Uh, predictions when we come back and news and No, notes. predictions now. All right. Well, then you make yours. i got to make mine on the fly. Oh, really? Yes. You're not ready? No, I'm not ready. Oh, come on. You know, I put have, thought all into our this. fans are like, okay, they've done the last seven teams, and now we got to, ah. So they can fast forward. Okay, you That's can the fast, beauty of a fast podcast. forward through the liner and we'll have predictions after the liner. You're tuned in to the Hockey Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Hockey Podcast for even more hockey news. Hashtag do it. Final segment, news and notes. But before we do that, because of my esteemed colleague across the table from me, we have to give predictions. This is this is by far the most difficult division to predict. For you. No, for an educated hockey follower, this is a difficult 
uh, division to predict. But since you seem to well, know then it all, then you should uh, be easy at this. Then yeah, okay, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> Turn my comments back around on me to make me think about it. Seven teams again. Top three are, are guaranteed a playoff spot. The next two are eligible to be wild cards, competing with the Central Division. The bottom two are definitely out. Why don't you give me your top three in order, and I'll give you my top three in order. L.A. Okay. San Jose. Okay. Anaheim. Okay. Yeah, see, this is this is how this division is going to go. I, I will say this before I give you my predictions. I think two through six. How's this for a bold prediction? We'll be separated. Two through six will be separated by six two points, points six at the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. At the end of the year. That's fair in this division. I have L.A. one. Okay. I think I think they have earned that, having oh, won the Stanley Cup yep. and gotten. I have Phoenix too. I think the the ownership being settled and everybody back I think really helps them. And I have Vancouver third because I do think Tortorella will get this team back on track. See, I think new coach. It's going to take a while for that team to adjust. I don't. He will be successful in Vancouver. I just don't think it's going to be this season. Well, it better be this season because both the Sedins are free agents next summer too. We but I don't. Uh, you know. A different tangent. I don't know if that's a bad thing. Well, especially with Tortorella. I've made this comment before. I could see him separating those two. Being the first person in their lives to separate the two of them. It's not fun. My son had twins on his team last year. And at the beginning of the season, we separated them. And then halfway through the season, they came together. They just start spinning in circles when they were separate. Well, they were on two different teams. There was an upper and a lower, a major and a minor. Oh, yeah. See, and the one left the minor came to the major team. But I'm saying, it's funny how when you have twins on a team, that dynamic's really, really weird. And I know of other mid- midgets in the Valley that are in that situation. It's just remarkable to me that they are at this point in their careers. And they're together. They've been together the whole time. They were drafted together. They were re-signed together. And, and I imagine next year... They'll probably still be in Vancouver after this upcoming sure. season. But wherever they go, they're going to be together, I'm sure. But I can, you absolutely could see Tortorella splitting them up, one on the first line, one on the second line, just just to get everybody realizing what he's capable of. Give me your two potential wild cards. My two wild cards, I have Phoenix at four. Okay. And I have Edmonton at five. Okay, I have San Jose at four, and I couldn't figure out where to put them. And I do have Edmonton at five, which... It's tough for me because I really think Anaheim is still a cup contender, and I have them at sixth in this division. And I'm I do think the math that I think that all of the Western Conference playoff teams are in this division. I agree with that. So that's why I feel comfortable with Phoenix at four and Edmonton at five. Who do you have at six? I have Vancouver at six. You have Vancouver missing the playoffs. Yeah. That is, let me just say, if that happens, it will be the most entertaining storyline this season. And it's not impossible. It's not. Because I just think my bones tell me that things are still a little unsettled. I just, you know, I just, in the earlier segment, said that Tortorella starting to talk to Luongo. That's all well and good, but his backup is? It's Eddie Lack. Well, this one, you know, there's a couple of teams that we've discussed in this division that have solid number one goalies, but they don't have that solid backup, and that could hurt you down the road. And I still think, you know, with Torts coming in, he's a great coach. There might be an adjustment period. Well, Vancouver's not as deep as they used to be. That's that's for sure. And then certainly a goal, they're not as deep as they used to be. And it would be the ultimate irony. And I certainly don't want this to happen. I mean, I like Luongo. I don't wish for anybody to get hurt. But if he were to get hurt. This team could definitely finish and not last because I forgot there's a seventh the, team. The, the only two teams that I would flip in my bold predictions would be Phoenix and Anaheim. I could see Phoenix finishing third. They'll be tied. They'll all be tied. Uh, seriously, and even LA in first is going to finish two points ahead. Would it shock you if LA finished fourth in this division? I mean, that's that's the thing about this division. You can make the case the Metro is harder because it's got all those the powerful scores and and some really good teams, and it's got an additional team. But I do think Edmonton's going to take that. Second wild card. No, and it's going to be interesting if they do because I don't think they're going anywhere for a while. Quick news and notes. I think we should start with this one. The NHL is shrinking goalie pads, which I think is probably the greatest news I've heard in the last couple of years. Why is that? Because just the way it's it's gone, the evolution of hockey, you look back and you watch highlights of the Oilers, those great teams back in the 80s or whatever, and you say, look, 
Wayne Gretzky got thousands of points. It's, it's just ridiculous. But then you see some of the other players that were putting up 100-point seasons that weren't nearly as good. And then you look at the goalie pads, and they're wearing like paper towel rolls on their legs. But now you see goalies that are wearing couch cushions. So I know we're not going to get back to where we were in the 80s, but I would like scoring up. And for all the weird ideas of, yeah, let's make the goal bigger, let's do this or that, all you got to do is just regulate the goalie pads, and they're finally doing that. They've already done it a little bit, but I, I like this this idea. What about the safety issue for the guy that's between the pipes? Well, okay. <laughs> Start with the fact that you're standing in front of 100-mile-per-hour slap shots with pucks. We're not we're not shrinking the helmet. We're not taking anything. We're just taking the actual pads on the goalie's legs, and we're shrinking them essentially on your average size goalie. Width or height? Two inches shorter. Okay, so that exposes the goalie's thighs. It, well, it exposes the five hole more than anything else. If you drop down as a butterfly goalie, you're losing essentially. Again, this is just your average the to- size the top goalie. Top of the pad. So you're losing, in theory, four inches of five hole. So what this means. And I give the NHL get the paddle of down, boys. Exactly. Get the paddle down. You've got to be even more fundamentally sound, and there's going to be more goals early this season. Like this is the thing that's great about the NHL that other sports just don't do, and college football is the absolute worst. When they implement a rule, it's in. If if this was college football, this rule would go in in four years. It is going in in a month. I have mixed emotions, All to right. say the least, on this. I just. Before we started, I was kind of rambling about it, and yes, this is a good excuse for management to say, oh, four million dollars. His goals against is four point five. No goals against are going to go up this year. Save percentage is eight seventy five. <laughs> Better not go that bad. I can see it being used against the goalies. Oh, well, yeah, I mean negotiations are what they are, and that's that's just a. Because management uses it, agents use it, they go right to the stat sheet. Well, yeah, agents have been using these stat sheets where goalies are giving up 1.6 goals per game, but they're wearing a refrigerator on each leg. <laughs> like, I mean, we got to the point where you could just tie a sumo wrestler in net. I don't care if he can move. If the puck can't find its way past him into the net, why would you just do that? Have you ever watched uh, goalies in uh, lacrosse, indoor lacrosse? Yes. That's a sumo wrestler in net. Oh, there you go. I, I don't want this to be lacrosse. I, I just, I don't know. I. Let me just be clear. My emotions are not mixed on this at all. I love it. Okay. I, I don't want it to go, I don't want it to get ridiculous. But Do you I, think it will? No, I think it'll stop here for a while. Okay. But I think that this is at least significant. It, it's going to be interesting to see if scoring does go up. I don't think it'll go up like a goal per game, but at least at the very beginning, like you said, goalies that are used to just dropping the pads and, and look, this hurts Pittsburgh more than anybody. You know Mark andre Fleury is going to be letting in like an extra six goals now just because of this. The goalies that, that are fundamentally sound and dropping that, that stick down to cover the five hole will be fine. Or they'll go back to the double stacking. Yeah, well, do whatever they got to do. I mean, it's, it's not going to increase scoring that much, but at the start of the year, I think there will be an adjustment period. Well, then, you know, I mean, the breezers would have to be adjusted because those thighs need to be protected. Yeah, and I'm sure some goalie's going to come out with, like, a stick that's 18 inches wide now and be like, Ah, you shrunk my, you shrunk <laughs> my pads, yeah, but look, yeah. at, look at the width of my paddle. Yeah, they'll, they'll fight back. <laughs> they'll do something. They'll come back. So I want to get to this Toronto story. There's, <sighs> of course, I don't know if it's controversy, rumor, whatever, that Nazem Kadri wants a new deal right now. Obviously, he wants a new deal right now because he's not signed and the season starts. In a couple weeks. I don't know what's taking so long. Well, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. Of Toronto doesn't have much money. And they need to re-sign Cody Franz and and Nazem Kadri. And they have to have some foresight to the fact that they are going to have to re-sign Dion Phaneuf and or Phil Kessel next year. Kadri. Other teams overspend. Well, yeah, but (laughs) they're at the cap. What are they going to do? This isn't Philadelphia where you just spend $50 over the cap and see what happens. Yeah, but Toronto has that kind of cash. Oh, yeah, but you gotta. I mean, you're you're restricted by the the sixty four point five million or whatever it is. The number keeps changing, but right in that area where you you can't go over. And I think the angle here and the the, the story to look at is if you're Nazem Kadri, obviously you want the most money you can get. I mean, that's your every job. player wants that. Your job is not to sure. to manage Toronto's cap. But what's the right move here for both sides collectively? Is it that bridge deal 
where a young player gets two years of more money, but not that huge deal yet, kind of like we saw with P.K. Subban. Or is it, if you're Toronto, are you giving him all $4.6 million you have left and saying you've earned it and this salary will go up even more next year? Because he's had one good year. He's had one year, really. He hasn't even been playing until last year. Yeah, so I think, you know, the bridge deal is a good deal. Right? I mean, yeah, it seems like it. it's... We, I think the thought when you see the bridge deal is, okay, well, the team is saving money now. They win. I mean, Montreal did this P.K. Subban last year, and he's going to win. Oh, absolutely. He absolutely cashed in. He won the Norris Trophy. When they sign him to his next deal, or whoever signs him, he's going to make a boatload of money. We're two weeks away from camp for most teams. You've got rosters are being set. You want to get into a camp somewhere. Yeah, they got to get Kadri resigned. I don't, I don't know what, what's what's going on with, with Toronto. I mean, this is this is the guy that the fans have been waiting to see and waiting to see, and they finally see him, and he's good, and now he's still not signed. And they haven't signed their other guy either. Yeah, they haven't signed Fra- Cody Franz either. Cody Franz is not signed. So, oof. But let's just stay with the Toronto theme here for a second. The thing that I miss around the league are the rookie tournaments more hockey I'm on board and I'm a big I watch a lot of junior hockey I watch a lot of youth hockey so I like watching young players and young and -and up-and-coming players I I I really enjoy it and these rookie tournaments we got the best of the best these are guys that are going to be playing in the NHL you know in Toronto this year is hosting in London Ontario uh, a four-team tournament round robin with themselves, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Ottawa. And then you've got the big one. You've got the Traverse um, tournament that has eight teams in it. Rangers, Carolina, Buffalo, Columbus, St. Louis, Dallas, Detroit, Minnesota. Whoa, that's a lot of good young talent that I would like to see. Now, am I going to fly to see the Rangers play the Hurricanes, no, I can't afford that, but it'd be nice if it was on television on the yeah, NHL it Network. It would be. And we had one for each region. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you just break it up into a bunch of little four and six and eight team, you know, whatever, because to your point, you're seeing the best prospects play, but you're also seeing them play against the other best prospects. And that, you know, it gets a little lost in the shuffle when Nathan McKinnon his first game that we're really going to get to see him, he's going to be on Colorado and he's going to be playing against, you know, whoever, L.A., and he's, well, he can't score on Jonathan Quick and he can't beat Drew Doughty, so maybe he's not that great. I want to see him against the other top prospects. I want to see prospects versus prospects and then see them slowly, because Nathan McKinnon might not even be a good example. He might be able to beat those guys, but 90% of the other top prospects are going to struggle when they first get in the NHL. Yes. So this is a good gauge of what they are able to do against their peers that they're now going to grow up with over the next you know, potentially 10 to 15 years. Yeah, I mean, it used to be a common thing. And the Traverse City one's a very – it's been around for a while. But I just just like to see that. I would like to see more of that. I'm going to take from that that we are that much closer to the NHL season. And I'm going to leave you with this. Uh Uh-oh. International Ice Hockey Federation. I don't even know if you saw this. We try not to prepare at all during the the show prep. Oh, we try to stumble each other. Yeah. Survey of players. I don't even know what that necessarily means, but it's basically a breakdown. IIHF players? Well, it's it's a breakdown of how many people are playing hockey around the world okay. and what countries they're from. Okay. So according to this, 1.64 million people are registered as playing the sport, 2.7% increase from last year. So that's good. Hockey's on the rise. Right. Canada, it's actually dropping. Now, take that for what it's worth. We're talking in Canada... 625,000 plus to 617,000 plus. There's still plenty of people. I mean, what is that? That's basically a third. It's kind of leveled off, I guess, is the best way to put it. But what's interesting is you look at places like the Czech Republic, it's up 13 plus percent, and Finland up nearly 18 percent. So all this really shows you is you can see that this sport is growing around the world, and you can see specifically where it's growing. What about USA? I don't have those sorts of numbers in front of me. Well, Who do you I'm think are asking. doing this in the U.S.? You talk for a second. I have them right here. I just have to figure it out. United Arab Emirates? Or are we talking U.S.? Because I have their numbers too. 118 registered players in the United Arab Emirates. That's interesting. I could go get on their uh, national team probably. 
No, it's hockey in the desert, right? I have to look into that. We're used to that. Yeah, that's that's a little more out there though <laughs> than it is here. I've got five. Well, what I can tell you because five hundred ten thousand Americans. But what I can tell you is, I've been in the valley since nineteen eighty six. Okay. Okay. So I've been here a long time. When I moved to the Phoenix area, you had the Phoenix Roadrunners. That was it. And. It was very popular, and I had my oldest registered, and when they play most rinks, you have to be signed up with USA Hockey. 1996, when the Phoenix Coyotes came to town, when the Jets moved here, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I can get them. The number of USA Hockey registered members has gone up every single year since the NHL team came to the Phoenix area. Oh, absolutely. And That's the just, future. Just growing and growing and growing. And now um, I'm a USA hockey coach, and I get to see the impact that USA hockey has had on just USA hockey with the national development program, uh, with the ladies program, with the U17 program. And they have a new model out called the American Development Model where they do cross-ice with younger players. So you don't have a five-year-old trying to skate 200 feet with a puck. It's ridiculous. Entertaining, but ridiculous. It is. I mean, basketball, other sports shrink the playing surface when they're really little so that they get used to the basic skills and stuff. And hockey never used to do that. And there's some dads. I talked to some dads, and they, they're they dead against playing cross-ice hockey. I, which I don't get. Even adults sometimes will do that just as a drill, and it's a great drill. It's almost like playing arena league football for a quarterback where you're so used to just everything's so tight and quick, you have to make quick decisions. You play half half rink, not even half rink, sideways rink, ice hockey. You will, you will get better at stopping and turning. Well, stopping, turning – Decision making because your space and time is taken away, and the other thing is touches. You get touches, you know. And next show, I'll bring out the Olympic study where Joe Sakic was in a playoff game, an Olympic game. Joe Sakic. He touched the puck for less than a minute in a sixty-minute game, and that that goes. We could get into this some other time, but that kind of goes to the point where sometimes just scrimmaging or playing in games isn't your best practice because you just don't touch the puck that much no matter who you are. You just said Joe Sack, a Hall of Famer, one of the best goal scorers I've ever seen. Right. Even a player like that, you're not touching the puck that much. Nope. This is goes back to this point, though, and, and you, you brought up the fact, I mean, we're in Phoenix. It's, this isn't the only city in the U.S. where this is happening, but there are fans here from other cities, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But the kids that are growing up here, and I'm sure it's the same in Nashville and, and some of the other non-traditional markets, are growing up as fans of that home city. And the U.S.'s numbers keep going up. And certainly this is one of those cities where those numbers are going well, up. I'll tell you, you know, an area, a non-traditional area that's doing a really, really good job of it is Dallas. That's another one. Dallas, the youth hockey moment in Dallas. And one more, San Jose. Their hockey, youth hockey program is phenomenal. That's the future. And I know that that sounds cheesy and, and kind of like a Whitney Houston song from the 90s talking about the children. Right. But it's true. It's true. And hockey is like, you know, it's an interesting stat that you brought up. Hockey is growing really, really strong here. And I think the opposite, though, with Canada, where it's leveling off, is Canada is being introduced to a lot of other sports. Yeah, it is. It's And again, if I'm Canadian, I'm not panicking and saying, I know there was a study a couple of years ago and they were like, well, our best players, you know, maybe they're looking at other sports. For the U.S., there was a time there where the best athletes were playing other sports. I'll tell you, a big sport that's growing in Canada, and it was never really a big sport, is basketball. I mean, this the the March Madness, there's a ton of Canadian basketball players on D1 schools now. The number never, one prospect in the country is from Canada. It, that is a sport in Canada that you just never, ever would have thought of. And see, that's part of the U.S. master plan. Get the Canadians interested in basketball, and we'll slowly take over hockey, and, and it'll show up. One final note, okay. Australia, now up to 20 rinks. Let's think about that. Kangaroos playing hockey. That is it for episode 18. Next week, we'll get you ready for training camp. It's not that far away. That's right. We have no more teams to break down, so tune in and be wowed, because I know I will be. Plus, whatever else happens in the next seven days, we'll be there wowing Doug. Thanks for listening to the Hockey Podcast.